Uh, so our last speaker for today's session will be Will Happer. Will was born in India in 1939 and spent a number of his early years there. After returning to the United States, he was educated at the University of North Carolina and Princeton University, where he received his PhD in 1964. After holding several other positions, Will has served on the faculty of Princeton since 1980, except for two years as head of the Office of Science of the US Department of Energy about 20 years ago. <laughs> Currently, he's the Cyrus Fogg Brackett Professor of Physics at Princeton. His interests have been primarily in atomic physics, optics, and spectroscopy. Much of his work involves spin polarized atoms and nuclei and a wide range of applications from medical imaging to atomic clocks, adaptive optics, and fundamental tests of physical laws. Will is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Humboldt Prize, the Breuder Prize, the Davis and Germer Prize, and the Thomas Alva Edison Patent Award. His title today is, How has, Why Has Global Warming Paused? Well, thank you very much. And uh, where is the guest of honor? I, I need to be able to see him. Uh, oh, there. Okay. <laughs> uh, you'll see why in just a bit. Okay, so uh, this is the title, Why Has Global Warming Paused? My, many of you perhaps don't realize that we have in our midst uh, Raymond Dyson, the climate scientist. And uh, this is the title of a book that was uh, published in 1982. And uh, there he is, Freeman Dyson, and uh, it's called The Long-Term Impacts of Increasing Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide Levels. So we'll come back to that in a minute, but Freeman has a long interest in climate. And, uh, but here is, he has a rival, the Al Gore is also interested in <laughs> climate. Uh, Al actually has the Nobel Prize, Freeman. Maybe, you, maybe there's still a lot of time, but, but we'll learn. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is the cover of Al's uh, most recent uh, book, you know. I, I've got a copy of it here from the Princeton uh, University Library. It's uh, quite uh, impressive, glossy. And this cover was taken from, um, as Al says, from a NASA satellite picture, so it's the real Earth. Uh, it's had a few uh, embellishments. Let me uh, show you the original, which I looked up. Uh, OK, this is the original, actually. There are a number of differences that if you look closely, fr first of all, there are lots more clouds on the original than on, uh, on the cover of the book. You know, you wouldn't want to confuse people with clouds, right? Here's the sun beaming down <laughs> on the earth. Uh, you know, you can see all this open water here and the North Pole and uh, uh, the original. It's actually not there. Uh, a minor detail, let's, let's go on. But the book actually has, um, the co there are, are two parts of the cover. This is the cover, and then if you open it up, uh, you, you can see uh, what happens to the Earth because of uh, the increases of carbon dioxide. So I'll show you the, that here. And so the, these are the uh, effects of continuing to uh, emit CO2. It's uh, really quite alarming, you know, the, uh, the Arctic Ocean kind of looks like the Caribbean. Uh, you know, the Greenland ice is all melted. Here's a big bay here that's filled with uh, seawater. For some reason, the ice around it is perfectly fine. The ice is okay in Iceland. But the most alarming thing to me, you know, as a physicist, is uh, somehow the law of angular momentum has been repealed. This hurricane is rotating the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, Here's another one. It's rotating the right direction, but it's on the equator. You know, those of you who know about hurricanes, the reason they rotate is because of the Coriolis force of the rotating Earth. So, you know, there is no Coriolis force on the equator. So uh, no one has ever seen a hurricane on the equator, ever. Okay, it doesn't happen. But uh, maybe it will. You know, I, who am I? To, uh, I don't have a Nobel Prize. Okay. All right. Well, uh, when I was preparing this, I was trying to find who had actually taken the photograph. So one of 
uh, Freeman's friend, uh, one of mine too, I'm glad to say is uh, the astronaut Harrison Schmidt, who uh, after retiring from being an astronaut was senator from New Mexico for a while. And when I was corresponding with him, he said, please wish Freeman a happy 90th birthday for me. We met many years ago when I visited Princeton and I've been an admirer for many reasons from astrophysics to strategic defense to issues with climate modeling. And then we got to talking about this photograph. He said, this is the photograph I took. It's from my camera. So this is directly from his camera. And it says, uh, well, if you look at this, maybe you can't see it, but it's of the, the South uh, Indian Ocean. And uh, it's a full picture of the globe. You know, by good luck, he took the photo when the sun was shining on everything below him. So I wrote him and I said, did, did you wait until you got just the right lighting to take the photo. He says, no, we, we were just busy and this was the first chance I got to shoot the picture. So anyway, here's the exchange. It's a very, very interesting exchange to talk to someone who has actually been there. And he was kind enough to say, um, I'm going to send you a, uh, a present for Freeman and it arrived this morning by FedEx. Uh, can somebody turn on this? Uh, uh, so I'm going to show you uh, the gift from, uh, there it is. So Freeman. <laughs> from Harrison Schmidt and uh, here's the photograph and there, uh, there's a note for you too, which I did not open. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, back to uh, the earth. It really is a beautiful place, isn't it, the earth? Uh, blue, wonderful clouds. Of course, the clouds uh, keep us cool. You know, if you change the clouds the slightest amount, it uh, has a huge effect on warming or cooling. We'll come back to that. So what's all the fuss about? We're, we're talking about the effects of increasing carbon dioxide. So this scale on the right is the uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide at parts per million up to about year 2012. We've just crossed 4,000 uh, 2013. This is uh, measurements taken at Mauna Loa. It's uh, wonderful work done by uh, uh, Keeling, uh, a, a real hero in this field. And it's steadily going up. There are little uh, blips and, uh, when we have economic recessions. And the, the oscillations up and down are summer and winter. You know, when the summer comes, the northern forests uh, suck CO2 out of the air, and so the CO2 levels drop rapidly during the summer and early fall, and then they recover during the winter and early spring, so up, down, up, down. The, this, these are huge oscillations if you measure up Barrow, Alaska, or somewhere like that. And here, here is uh, the Earth's temperature from uh, Hadley, uh, the British site, but all, all temperature records look much the same nowadays. Uh, and you can see there, there's not a whole lot of correspondence between the temperature. It's been quite flat, if anything, going down slightly for the last 15 years since 1998. This was a big El Nino year, this spike. And then there's some down years here due to volcanoes in the, in the Philippines. And then there was a period of cooling from up to 1980, 75 or 80 or so. Down here is uh, one of the possible other correlations besides CO2, this is the phase of the uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which actually fits quite a lot better. I don't know, CO2, it's not bad for the uh, cost of a first stamp, uh, first class stamp, but it's not terribly good for, for temperature. Well, uh, everybody, I, I mentioned everybody gets the same result. This is from NOAA. You can see the last 10 years, there has been no change in temperature. It's the ocean, land. Uh, you know, and the, the people are beginning to notice. This is one of the first things I, I saw in print. This was from Der Spiegel uh, earlier this year in January. And the title says, Porsche Retzen über Stillstand bei Erdewärmung. So uh, researchers are scratching their head uh, about the pause in uh, the uh, in global warming, which is the title 
of my talk today, you know. So what we're looking at here is year. The uh, bars here with error bars, uh, black points are measured temperature, and, and the various colors are predictions from IPCC. Okay, so um, not too good. All right. Well, uh, you might say, well, that's Der Spiegel. Well, this came out in Nature last week. So this is, uh, you can look it up, Nature, climate change. And so what I'm showing you here is uh, the results of models of what the temperature rise per decade should be in centigrade, centigrade per decade uh, compared with these red bars are what's actually observed. Okay, so the many, many different models, of big, expensive computers uh, all over the world. And so the, the, the left here is from uh, 1993 to 2012. The right is 1998 to 2012. So there, the 20 year interval, the last 10 year interval, it's worse on the last 10 years. It's getting worse with time. Uh, but here's, uh, here's Freeman's uh, prediction from the book I just showed you. So uh, we were pretty good, you know, right in the middle of the pack, you know. So anyone who, who says that uh, Freeman is a contrarian is completely wrong. He, he was as wrong as anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> but I was there with you, Freeman, so I, I share some of the blame. <laughs> All right, so, um, so something is seriously wrong with the models. All right, let's uh, talk about what it might be. So let me review for you a little bit about the basic physics of uh, the Earth's temperature. We're, of course, warm by the sun. If it weren't for the sun, we have rapidly cooled down to uh, horribly cold temperatures. Uh, about 70% of the sun makes it to the surface of the Earth because some is reflected by clouds, some by Rayleigh scattering the beautiful blue light of the, of the sky. Uh, and some is actually reflected by the surface instead of turned into heat. So roughly 70% makes it down here. Then the Earth has to get rid of the heat or else the surface would warm up and it gets rid of that in a much more complicated way. Close to the ground, most of the heat is, is carried away by convection because if you put in the numbers, there's no way you can radiate enough and keep the atmosphere stable. So there's a convective layer about 10 kilometers thick, the troposphere, where, where most of the uh, energy of the hot surface is being carried up by churning air parcels, mostly water, vapor condensing often. Uh, and when it gets high enough, it's able to be released to, to space. A, a very tiny amount on very clear parts of the Earth uh, actually can radiate directly into space. And uh, that's where many of the uh, alarmist models are focused on this almost trivial amount of the cooling that's there. Okay, the, the, this is quite accurate from NASA. Some things that uh, I, I need to remind you who, are not, who don't live and breathe this stuff all the time is if you look at the structure of the Earth's atmosphere, the first 10 kilometers are the troposphere, this region I told you where the air is churning round and round and, and carrying heat up. Uh, and uh, when it gets to about 10 kilometers, uh, there's enough radiative clarity that it can radiate the heat. And from then on, there's no more churning and we're in the stratosphere. And from the stratosphere on up, the uh, uh, loss of heat is entirely by radiation of infrared. Uh, as a result of this chaining, uh, churning motion here, the troposphere is, is roughly isentropic. So the entropy per kilogram is the same at the ground level as it is at 10 kilometers because the expansion of the uh, air cools it enough to keep the entropy per kilogram constant. It's what you would expect for a convective process, and it's what you measure. Okay, well, I mentioned uh, atmospheric motions, and so this is a nice picture that at least gives you the, a rough idea of how the Earth works. Uh, the sun is hottest along the equator, and so there's a lot of heat to remove at the equator, and that is uh, called the equatorial uh, convergence zone, and this is a region of uh, very severe thunderstorms, lots and lots of rising hot air. And part of it heads north, uh, raining out, you know, lots of uh, water in the process. Part of it goes south. These are the Hadley cells. Uh, 
these fall down to the earth at about 30 degrees. You see that's northern New Mexico, the Chihuahuan Desert. Over in Europe, it's the Sahara Desert. So these descending cells are bands of desert around the earth. There are similar ones in the south. And then there's a, a couple of more cells there. And as a result of this circulation, uh, at least if the law of conservation of angular momentum continues to hold, the, the, this returning air coming from uh, mid-latitudes toward the equator is, is thrown eastward. This makes the trade winds, the important trade winds that were so important to the uh, settlement of the Americas and the uh, uh, trading ships that w relied on wind. And in, in the north, as it moves north, the same conservation of energy gives us the westerly. So we have easterlies near the equator, westerlies in the temperate zones. And, uh, pretty complicated stuff up near the poles. But anyway, you have to keep that picture in mind if it's not familiar already. Uh, well, okay, how we've talked about radiation. There's only one way to cool the Earth to space, and that's radiation, you know. The, and so the Earth uh, is absorbing sunlight, which is this red curve here. The sun is uh, a little under 6,000 degrees, 55 Kelvin black body here. Not all of that radiation gets to the surface because there's absorption by overtones of water here. There's a lot of uh, Rayleigh scattering, the blue skylight that we see here. But 70% uh, roughly gets to the surface. And then the surface uh, has to re-radiate that. Uh, and uh, if the surface tries to re-radiate directly to space, it has the problem that it can't get through the atmosphere because the atmosphere is full of gases that absorb infrared radiation. So here are the uh, actual components. Water is by far the most important. You can see the absorption bands of water. This is the, this is the attenuation probability between the ground to space. And you see there's a narrow window here for water. It's around 10. Uh, 10 microns, we'll come back to that in a minute. Here's CO2, it's actually in the water band, so it's hard for CO2 to make a lot of difference, and it's not a very broad band anyway. CO2 has some other bands, but they're at the edge of the black body curve, so it, they don't matter very much. And there are very other, there are other minor gases here. So I have to remember this picture. So part of the message here is that most of the radiation actually doesn't come from the ground because there isn't enough atmospheric window and most of the time it's not a clear day anyway. This is only for clear days. If it's cloudy, nothing gets through from the ground to space. And most of the Earth is cloudy actually, or at least partly cloudy. Here's some examples of what you see if you look at the infrared coming from the Earth. Uh, and um, so this is uh, infrared uh, uh, frequency and wave numbers, uh, that's the standard unit for infrared spectroscopy. So, for example, here's the tropical western Pacific, and you see that uh, here's CO2. There's a big gap eaten out of the infrared, but it's not zero. There's still quite a bit of CO2 radiating to space, uh, e even though uh, even though the transmission to space is, is, at, is uh, zero. And the reason that happens is if you can't get there from the ground, you simply radiate from higher up. So CO2 radiates into space from the stratosphere, but it still is shedding a, quite a bit of heat. Here's water radiating uh, uh, at intermediate altitudes. And th this is the famous infrared window that uh, is being encroached on by added CO2. So the CO2 band is slightly broadening as we add more as we burn more fossil fuel. So it's important to look at actual data. You know, I've, I've always been uh, a fan of data. I'm happy to look at computer calculations. I use them myself. But if they don't agree with data, then they don't mean anything. This is one of my favorites. This is the Antarctic ice sheet. And over Antarctica, the, you can see the ice sheet is really cold, 180 uh, Kelvin. And so the air above the uh, Antarctic is much warmer than the ice sheet itself. So the CO2 band in the Arctic is actually in emission. And, uh, ah, well, acoustic noise. All right, well, I, uh, I got up early this morning and I downloaded the uh, latest uh, satellite images of the Earth. And so here they were at dawn. And uh, so this is today. Uh, 
It's just beginning to warm up. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just beginning to get light here in, in, in Wisconsin, which is where the uh, base is. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's still dark in California at, at dawn, Wisconsin. And so what you see, in, and this is a visible spectrum, so white means lots of reflected sunlight. Dark means that lots of absorbed sunlight heating the surface. So white is more clouds, and so these are cloud tops. Or, and uh, black is cloud-free regions. But of course, this, this is only for absorption. The, the, the key for maintaining the temperature of the Earth is the balance between the absorption of this visible light and the radiation of the uh, infrared light. So let's look at uh, radiation. So here is uh, short-wave infrared, uh, 3.9 microns. This is so short-wave, actually, that there's practically no impact of it on the cooling of the Earth, but you can see it easily, and the detectors are good, so satellite guys like to detect this. But what you see here is that almost nowhere is the Earth actually uh, free of clouds. The entire areas here of the uh, eastern Pacific are cloud covered, northern Pacific is cloud covered, the western U.S. is cloud covered, clouds all over the place, uh, the continents too. And uh, white clouds mean very cold clouds. So th this is uh, thermal emission. It's not sunlight. So you can see even though it's before dawn here on, on the left side of this picture, it's, it's shining just fine at night, you know, because it's from the heat of the, uh, of the atmosphere. Let's look at a couple more here. Is, uh, here's water vapor bands. So if you look down at 6.5 microns, that's right where the bending mode of water is particularly strong. And you see quite a different uh, picture. You see big dark areas here. And uh, these are the descending branches of the Hadley cell, where I, I showed you these big cells of air going up from the equator and falling down. They're not nearly as uniform as a picture, and they, they change from hour to hour and day to day. But roughly speaking, if you average them, you get the picture I showed you. But they're black because that means that uh, this is water vapor that has gotten to very low altitude, so it's quite warm. It's not much colder than the surface of the Earth, so it's radiating extremely well. And near the equator, you've got water that's been lofted very, very high. So it's white because it's not releasing much radiation to space. And finally, here is uh, here's the infrared wind at 10.7 microns. And it's like all of the other sort of, uh, pictures we've looked at. The Earth is covered with clouds. It's a little hard to tell looking at this if you see intermediate clouds, which cover most of the Earth, whether they're low, warm clouds or whether they're high, cold, cirrus, but semi-transparent clouds. So people who analyze this data look at lots of different wavelength bands, and they've studied how particulates attenuate to figure out what fraction of, these cl of this cloud cover is uh, low clouds and how much is high cirrus. The low clouds are all fundamentally cooling mechanisms. They shield the Earth and they still radiate nicely to space. These very high clouds are actually warm the Earth because they cut down on the cooling efficiency and they often don't absorb much sunlight. They're often quite wispy, so the sunlight gets through but the infrared doesn't get out. Okay, but uh, the bottom line, let me just emphasize, is that uh, the, the clouds are the 800-pound gorilla. This is a point that Freeman has made many times, that uh, if you ask, why is there so much problem getting the right answer? Why doesn't it agree with observations? Uh, the most likely thing is the, cl the clouds have not been done right. And you can see why from looking at these pictures. It, it's really very hard. Uh, well, here's a one-slide summary of uh, global warming theory. Uh, so that this says that if you increase the uh, radiation coming to the surface because you've got more CO2, uh, CO2, of course, radiates down as well as up, so this is the change in the CO2 radiation, that it will increase the temperature of the Earth by what the current temperature is now, Te, which uh, the current temperature is about 288 Kelvin, divided by four times the... Uh, current radiation efficiency of the Earth, uh, which is, uh, I guess it's here, 236 watts per square uh, meter. This is the sunlight coming in. You have to divide by four because it's 
4 pi uh, r squared for the surface of a sphere and, and only pi r squared for the surface of a disk. So that's where the 4 comes from. And, and then there's the uh, albedo of the Earth. 30% of the light is reflected before it ever gets turned into heat. So anyway, uh, th this is the formula. So um, the curves I was showing you that didn't work, including, Freeman, uh, including Freeman's, uh, uh, all predict that if you double CO2, you get uh, on the order three, three and a half degrees Kelvin of warming, uh, without exception. And, and you can see here that, uh, that that prediction depends on two unknown things, or things not known terribly well. It's how much you inc increase the radiation hitting the surface of the Earth from more CO2. And then what I didn't mention is this is, is the celebrated feedback factor. So that what, what this feedback means is that as you warm the surface of the Earth, you might get more clouds, or you might get less clouds, or you might change the temperature distribution you know, on how uh, CO2 and water vapor radiate. So if you put all those things together and, and lump them together, that's called the, uh, the feedback factor. And there's, there's a simple formula for it. It's, it's the rate of change of 1 minus the uh, albedo with temperature and the rate of change of the effective emissivity with uh, temperature logarithms of both of them. Okay, so that's uh, enough for that. But, but uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, switch to... Uh, look at which of these could be wrong. They're probably both wrong. But uh, I'd, I'd like to focus on the one that most people are most confident on, which is the uh, uh, forcing from more CO2. Th this is probably wrong just as well as the feedback. Something's clearly wrong. Well, OK, here's, here's the villain. And it's, uh, it's the molecule CO2. The molecule CO2 is a linear molecule. Here, I, I brought a model of CO2, you know. <laughs> It's green, right? Because it's making the plants grow. And so here it is. <laughs> so this is this is the CO2. And um, I, I was uh, hoping that maybe we could uh, turn on our Elmo for just a minute here, because uh, most people, you know, they, they listen to the nightly news or Al Gore and uh, don't uh, have any direct uh, experience with CO2. You remember we were talking about uh, CO2 just crossed 400 parts per million uh, this summer at Mauna Loa. So who would hazard a guess? What, what is the CO2 level in the room here? I have a meter here, so I, you know, <laughs> don't be don't be too rash. <laughs> okay, well here here's here's what we are today. Uh, I don't know. Can you see that? 830. It's going up. <laughs> now, if you, if you would please stop breathing. You know. <laughs> uh, all right, well, actually, you know, your own breath, exhale breath, the reason it's such a big effect is your exhale breath is 40,000 parts per million. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge amount, you know. The amount in the air is, is, is trivial. So uh, living things uh, produce CO2. You could see that in the pictures of the Keeling curves, you know, big oscillations, summer and winter. All right, so as I mentioned, CO2 is a, uh, a three-dimensional molecule, uh, three, I mean three-atom molecule. So it has three normal modes. Um, it has a asymmetric stretch mode, which does absorb radiation, but at much too high a frequency. This is way outside the thermal emission band of the Earth. It's got the bending mode that I was showing you, this mode here. So this is the one that causes global warming, this floppy mode here. And then it's got a symmetric stretch mode, which uh, doesn't radiate because as the um, molecules go in and out, there's no dipole moment change. And so it's a uh, transmitter without an antenna. You, if you don't change the dipole moment, you can't radiate. But there's a hooker here, which uh, I'll, I'll tell you about, and that is uh, you should look at these numbers. This is, this is the frequency. Uh, you see, it's Satan's number, 666. It, I've always knew, known there was something fundamentally uh, threatening here. And, um, but, but Satan's number is a sort of half of the uh, symmetric stretch number. So in fact, uh, the overtones of this mode interact very, very strongly with these infrared inactive modes here. 
And that, that turns out to have a big effect on how CO2 uh, causes global warming. So let me, uh, actually, uh, I, I knew I was going to have a m musician here, and so I uh, thought I'd bring a little, uh, another model. This is a, uh, this is a towel rack, and where, where is Sid Drell? I, I, yeah. Anyway, okay, Sid, you got perfect pitch? Uh, guy, I, I need something that bangs on this a little harder. That, that's, by the way, the bending mode. That's the bending mode of CO2. You're right, it's C+. Plus. Very good. Yeah, Sid, I, 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 you never cease to impress me. Okay. I, when I first tried that prop, uh, I had it in my briefcase and was trying to get into an airplane on New York Airport. I missed my airplane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so sometimes you can be too smart for your own good. <laughs> All right, so uh, so here's... Uh, now, if, if you actually look in detail at the spectrum of CO2, these are the bending modes, and, uh, and of course, if it's bending, it can be rotating on its axis at the same time. So the actual infrared spectrum has uh, axial angular momentum, as usual in quantum mechanics, one, two, three, four. And so these are the states of maximum axial angular momentum. They're extremely harmonic. They, they vary by a fraction of a percent as you go up the ladder here. But all the other states can mix with the uh, other modes that I mentioned. And so the spectrum is a real mess. And the, the guy who first sorted it out was Fermi. So this is one of my favorite pictures of Fermi. There's alpha, right? H, H bar squared over EC. Uh, um, well, it, if you're not a physicist, maybe you're <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know. He, he's, <laughs> he's a demigod anyway. Uh, here's another slide that I, I, the best I could get from the net, but uh, what it illustrates is another reason the CO2 molecule spectrum is so complicated because not only is this flopping up and down, but it's rotating around as it's flopping up and down, and the direction I'm flopping it uh, affects the spectrum. So if, I, if it rotates while I'm flopping it up and down, we have what you call Q branch radiation. So you look at it and you can't see any rotational Doppler shift if it rotates this way. But if, it, if it's going this way as it rotates, then you get big Doppler shifts. So that produces the P and the R branches of, uh, of the molecular band. And uh, the thing that's wrong with this is this is a, a zero state here and a zero state, so zero to zero doesn't doesn't work because photon has to have at least one unit of angular momentum. Uh, all right, so now we're getting further and further into the nitty gritties of the uh, how CO2 works. So uh, in radiative transfer, the key uh, quantity is the attenuation rate uh, of radiation, and that's the number density of molecules times the cross section. So this will be an inverse length. And the cross-section is, is, is traditionally written as a line strength times a uh, line shape factor. So two factors here. The line strength is pretty straightforward. It's the uh, square of the dipole moment, and it takes into account stimulated emission as well as absorption. So it has a factor here, which is the correction for uh, amplification as opposed to attenuation of radiation. And, uh, you know, a statistical average, so it's uh, got a partition function. Very straightforward. The, uh, now, the, the line shapes is, is where the, the rest of this talk is going to be uh, focused on. The line shape is something, it's a function of frequency. It tells you whether it's a Lorentzian line or something more complicated, whether it's Doppler broadened or something like that. So it, the simplest line shape is the Lorentzian line shape. Which, uh, in which the uh, intensity of the absorption or the emission falls off as the square of the detuning. And it, it has a width parameter that is entirely, uh, entirely controlled by pressure for CO2. Um, you know, numbers are important. And so uh, for CO2, you would 
normally say th this is partly, you know, the natural line width from its lifetime, radiative lifetime plus pressure broadening. But the radiative lifetime of CO2 is two or three seconds. So the radiative broadening, natural broadening, is completely neg negligible. It's, it's, it's entirely due to collisions. And sometimes you take into account the, uh, uh, the Doppler motion, especially at very high altitudes, that can be important. So it's easy to convolve this with a Doppler distribution of velocities if, if there's little enough broadening that that, that makes any difference. OK. Uh, all right, so here's, so here's the uh, situation for CO2. These red points are all of the line strengths that I mentioned to you the ability of CO2 to absorb radiation. You can see on this picture, if you actually count them up, there are approximately 4,000 of them here. And the, the sharp features in the middle are the Q lines that I mentioned, the Q branches of the uh, band. And the angel wings on either side are the P and the R branches where there's a lot of rotational Doppler broadening. And so they're all there at once, and uh, they're all absorbing. And for, for comparison, here are the water lines. You can see, especially on the low frequency end, the water is sort of dominating here. So this end of the band really doesn't make much difference it's because it's, it's under the control of water. There's less water at the high frequency end, but the, even there, it's a bit of a problem. OK. Uh, well, these are line strengths. To actually do radiative transfer calculations, you need to know cross sections. So. Uh, you have to multiply by line width factors. And here's where the real uh, questions begin to crop up. So this is, this is cross-section. You can see it's in units of square centimeters. So the biggest cross-sections are like 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the minus 18, even a little bit bigger, or perhaps 2, 3, 4 times 10 to the minus 18. This is the central Q, uh, Q branch of CO2. Uh, but it turns out these cross sections in the middle of the band are so big, it, they don't matter at all. So th this is already uh, irrelevant for global warming. And the cross sections down here are too small for global warming. So there's a fairly narrow region of cross sections at the left of the band and the right end of the band, which can make any difference at all. And this is where you can uh, change from an optical depth of uh, a few meters to a few tens of kilometers by changing CO2 by a factor of two. And if you can't do that, it doesn't matter. And you can see that uh, what I've done here is plot red for uh, a pure Lorentzian or Voigt line. Voigt means you include Doppler broadening. And uh, red is uh, taking a more reasonable far wing line shape that agrees with measurements and agrees with uh, simple theory. And, and you can see it makes a huge difference. So if you take the wrong line shape, you over-predict the warming from more CO2. This blue line is too big. This is almost certainly wrong. But if you talk to people who do the modeling, most of them use the blue line. OK, uh, let's uh, mention one other issue is that the, these cross sections I mentioned are completely controlled by pressure broadening. So they're very different at different altitudes. So red is the cross section at ground level at the center of the CO2 band. That's so strong that it doesn't differ very much when you don't get to 11 kilometers the top of the troposphere. But it's, it's a little bit different. And, and you don't begin to see the individual lines in the bands until you get way up in near the top of the stratosphere, 50 kilometers or thereabouts. So this also is hard to uh, systematically take into account. So I, this, this is to wake you up, you know. So the, uh, <laughs> this is Hedy Lamarr. And uh, I always admired Hedy Lamarr. This is, uh, you know, she not only was a great actress, uh, but she was very interested in electrical engineering for some reason. And uh, just at the end of the 30s, uh, she and... Uh, and Antiel, Lamar Antiel, uh, uh, submitted this patent to defeat uh, German uh, anti-torpedo uh, devices that were we expected to give us a lot of trouble. Uh, the Navy didn't buy it. It did give us a lot of trouble, you know, <laughs> so the usual. But the, uh, the idea was uh, this is one of the first uh, spread spectrum uh, 
proposals that I know of, but, the, but they were, were going to communicate acoustically through the water. And uh, so they had um, 88 frequencies, which is the number of keys, you know, white and black on a piano keyboard. And uh, so you, you would send out these different frequencies at random, you know, with a code, but not a pseudo-random, so your torpedo knew what the right code was, and you knew what the right code was, but the Germans wouldn't know what it was. So CO2 actually works just like this, you know, as it's radiating and absorbing, it's hopping from frequency to frequency. And I mentioned, here she had only 88 frequencies, uh, but uh, CO2 has, uh, I think I mentioned here, there are roughly 4,000 frequencies. So if at every collision, uh, CO2 uh, jumps from radiating at this frequency to this frequency to this frequency. It's hopping around in frequency space. Now that turns out to have a big influence on, on how effective it is in global warming. Let's see why. Uh, so here are a couple of limiting cases on how you could hop in frequency. Lorentz thought about this back in 1900, and uh, his model was that you simply randomize the phase. So if you keep the amplitude of an oscillator, here he took two oscillators, a frequency one, a frequency two, and, uh, and these uh, red dots are collisions, and at the collisions the phase of this oscillation is random and the frequency is, is toggled between these two. And so this is a phase hopping uh, transfer. This, this is not very realistic. Uh, almost certainly this is not what CO2 does, but that's what's assumed. Okay. This is uh, a bit more realistic. This says that if you have a collision at these red spots, exactly the same as here, that you do shift from one frequency to the other. You toggle back and forth, but you do not, uh, uh, you do not shift the phase. So the phase remains constant, but the frequency modulates. So this is frequency hopping, phase hopping. This also is not what CO2 really does, but it's a little closer, probably. So. Uh, you can see the difference, uh, especially if you imagine now that the collision frequencies, which here are where these red dots are, they're not very frequent. So there's plenty of time to get lots of oscillations between collisions. If you make that uh, rate very fast, the, uh, whoops, uh, wrong way. Here's what happens. So for the um, phase shift, you get this horrible, jagged mess uh, if, you, if you have many collisions per oscillation period, so here are the red lines, lots of collisions. But if you have uh, frequency hop, it actually gets better because what happens is the oscillator oscillates at the average of the two frequencies of the two lines that are coupled. So instead of oscillating at one or two, you oscillate at 1.5. And so the more collisions you get, the narrower the line becomes. This is. In some communities, we would call this Dickey narrowing, but it's a common phenomenon it, that you see across physics. It's the same phenomenon that works in the Merzbauer effect and in motional narrowing in uh, magnetic resonance. So, okay, CO2 is neither one of these, but you can see that it, it makes a huge difference to uh, line width. This, you can imagine, would have an enormous line width if you Fourier transformed that uh, spectrum, and this would have quite a narrow line width, peaked on the average frequency. Uh, and indeed, here, here's just to make the point, you can do this analytically, but these are simply uh, numerical tests of this. So you, you write yourself a little computer program and you let it hop back and forth between two frequencies, more like the CO2 frequencies, 660 and 670 wave numbers. And uh, depending on how you make that hop, for example, the phase hop that Lorentz assumed and most computer models seem to assume, frequency hop, uh, and uh, a chirp, which is probably closer, closest to the truth, where the frequency just gradually changes, the far wings get less and less and less intense. And uh, you, you could say, why does that matter? And the, the reason it matters is the structure of the uh, CO2 band uh, here has the intensity at the center of the line is... Uh, how many orders of magnitude? One, two, three, four, five, five or six orders of magnitude more intense than the intensity at the edges. All of the global warming is coming from the edges of the band. And a good fraction of the absorption there 
can come from far wing broadening uh, of the extremely intense lines in the center of the band, because most of the atoms there are, are most of the molecules are in their ground state. Okay. All right, well, this is, uh, uh, this is an example of what the edges of the bands look like and what a big difference it makes. So the, uh, the, the, the points are cross-sections. If you, if you take a realistic far-wing line shape, you know, that is not so, not so um, slowly falling off. And, and the uh, unpointed things, the, the various dotted lines, are, uh, are uh, for Lorentz broadening. And so there are orders of magnitude difference between the uh, realistic lines and, and the lines uh, that you would get from Lorentz uh, line widths. Okay, well, uh, let's uh, talk a little more. You can be more quantitative here. I think most people know that the heart of radiative transfer calculations is the Schwarzschild equation, which says if you look, say, down on the Earth uh, to see what brightness is coming up from the surface of the Earth, it's the brightness of the surface attenuated by whatever the attenuation coefficient is from ground to space. And then there's the emission from molecules at every altitude between the ground and outer space. So that is the product of the Planck brightness, the attenuation coefficient at the altitude of emission, and then you integrate over the entire path length. Planck brightness, of course, our famous friend Planck is um, it's an, a quantized oscillator, so it has a, uh, this uh, Bose factor there. And the attenuation rate, you have to be careful to include uh, spontaneous uh, uh, emission, amplification, as well as attenuation. This is the line strength in disguise. And optical depth is the integral of the attenuation rate to space. So these are actual m measurements here. So this is looking down to the uh, surface of the Earth from a high-flying airplane, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, this is the infrared window at 10 microns. Uh, and there you see the temperature of the Earth. So you see a pretty good black body curve at the temperature of the surface. Here is the middle of the CO2 band. CO2 is also on a black body curve. But the, this is a black body curve at around 220 or 230 Kelvin. So it's a cooler black body, and that, that's actually the temperature of the middle uh, stratosphere. So most of CO2 emissions to space is coming from the uh, middle stratosphere. And then this is water vapor here. And uh, if you, instead of looking down, you look up, you see sort of the mirror image of this. And uh, so close to ground level, if you look up, you see whatever your surface temperature is. So you see the surface black body curve. And, and if it's a nice clear day, if you look up, you see the cold temperature of empty space. There's no radiation in the window. So, uh, and here's water vapor here radiating like crazy. This is the bending mode of water vapor. Uh, just, just to give you a feeling, many of you don't realize this, but the CO2 absorbs so well that at the center of band of CO2, the, the uh, attenuation length is about, about six inches. So if I had infrared eyes, I couldn't see a one of you. I couldn't even see my screen, you know. And so, uh, but uh, you know, at the optical, at the wavelengths where it causes global warming, the attenuation length is 10 kilometers. It's the depth of the uh, of the tropopause. So it has this enormous range of uh, attenuations. Okay, so you can calculate these with, uh, it's too late, it's too close to drink time to go through this. So we'll, uh, and here, here's a calculation that uh, I ran. And so this is downwelling radiation at the surface uh, versus wave uh, number. At the center of the CO2 band, you basically see only the temperature of the surface. It doesn't matter how much CO2 is there. And it's only in t when you get to the edges of the band that you begin to uh, be sensitive to the temperature uh, and to the amount of CO2. So, uh, but even here you see it makes a huge difference at the edges of the band where it, where it counts, whether you're using a Lorentz uh, uh, profile for the line or whether you're using a more realistic profile. The realistic profiles have a lot less warming than the Lorentz profiles commonly used. And if you double CO2, this is 390. So if you double it, uh, uh, 
uh, oops, uh, you can see the, the shape doesn't change very much. Uh, it just gets a little broader. So you double it, broadens, ha cut it by half, double it, broadens. So the, uh, the effect of adding more CO2 is to produce a little bit more uh, less efficient cooling at the edges of the band, mostly this one. This one almost doesn't matter because it's water. All right, so that's the, uh, the idea. If you, now, if you put in numbers, if you use Voigt profiles, the Lorentz profiles, you get, you increase the radiation force increment from doubling by about a factor of 1.4. Okay, so we've, we're, look, we're searching, 1.4, by the way, is not nearly enough to explain the discrepancy between the models, but it's one of many factors that uh, needs to be looked at more carefully than uh, has been now. Okay, so uh, I, I've told you that um, there's a real problem with the performance of uh, climate models. They're not even close to being right. You know, when I think, I was thinking coming over here about the situation with solar neutrinos. With solar neutrinos, you know, you had a nice theory and the measurements were not in agreement, but it was only a factor of two, <laughs> right? With, the, with these models here, we're talking about a factor of 10 or more. You know, it's a huge effect. And uh, it'd be a good idea to figure out why that's so and get it straight. Certainly CO2 has to cause warming, you know, I don't deny that. Certainly CO2 is increasing, I don't deny that either. But uh, the, the uh, inferences from those two facts are, are not holding together at all. Okay, well, you might ask, is, is there any truth to this? The answer is yes, measurements uh, have been made on this. So for example, this is a measurement on a balloon. So if you look at the limb of the Earth from a balloon uh, and you, look at what you actually measure, which is the light gray here, and you compare it to the best climate models, which is the dark uh, gray here. This is, by the way, where all the warming comes from. They're not even close. Okay, so there's even, uh, there's no question experimentally that the, there's a serious problem with uh, how you do the far wing uh, modeling for uh, radiation transfer. All right, uh, this is just a few years ago. Well, I, th I think that's all I'm going to say. I'd like to uh, leave some time for a question, so let me see. Is this my last call? This is for Freeman, so happy 90th birthday, Freeman. And I, I, thought I like this uh, quote here from, <laughs> you know, from uh, Hendrik Ibsen. It says, I'm in revolt against the age-old lie that the majority is always right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.